Hello and welcome to the uh, Center for Research Libraries webinar on text and data mining, supporting researcher needs. I'm uh, Bernie Riley, I'm the president of the Center for Research Libraries. This uh, webinar is going to be a global is one of the events of the Global Resources Forum. The uh, Global Resources Forum is a set of activities, events, and resources that support informed collection development and informed collection management. It consists of analysis uh, and providing intelligence to and due diligence to inform library investment in electronic resources and traditional collections. This is a uh, third in a series of text and data mining webinars that CRL has hosted. Uh, this is this will not be an overview of TDM, um, and we won't be going deeply into technical methods. Although there will be some case studies shown, we won't get into such details as things like topic modeling and that kind of thing. We have provided a lot of resources for that um, and information on um, the text and data mining in general, and also some technical methods. There is Ann Okerson's paper that was produced for IFLA and posted on the web, and that's linked to from the event page, as well as the um, webinar uh, PowerPoints and audio from previous CRR webinars. Those are also, you can find those on the events page, of, on, the, on the page for this event today on the CRR website. Um, for today's agenda, we've um, muted your phones, not because we're inherently fascist, but because we have about 200 people registered for participating in the webinar. And with that many people, we could uh, potentially get an enormous amount of audio feedback from um, phones if we put background noise on your phones if we didn't, uh, we didn't mute them. But we are taking questions. In fact, we encourage you to ask questions and su submit your comments using the chat function on your screen. The, um, let me see, we will be, um, we have um, reviewed the questions that many of you posed when you registered for this webinar and we'll be feeding them to the speakers periodically. We'll try to address as many as we can. Um, our speakers today are three. Um, first, Robert Scott from Columbia University. Um, Robert Scott is Digital Humanities Librarian at Columbia University. He's directed activities of the, the activities of the Digital Humanities Center at Columbia, which was formerly the Electronic Tech Service since um, 1994. And in that capacity has been witness to the evolution of library support for work with electronic resources and humanities from the localized CD-ROM era to today's environment of big data in the cloud. He's also worked to, um, his work has provided them with a variety of opportunities to consult with individual scholars to design and contribute to larger scale text pub textual publications and analysis projects and to develop and oversee user services for digital scholars. Um, actually, we went the slide before, we we'll be on now. Kala Vlataru is the 2013-2014 Yahoo Fellow in Residence for International Values, Communications, Technology, and the Global Internet at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. In December 2013, Kala uh, was named by Foreign Policy Magazine one of its top 100 global thinkers of 2013. And his work has been profiled in Nature, uh, the New York Times, The Economist, the BBC, and media of more than 100 countries. His most recent collaborations include the first in-depth study of the geography of social media and the changing role of distance and location in online communicative behavior around the world. He's also created the Gedelt um, database of more than a quarter billion geo-referenced global events from 1979 to the present. He's, um, so he's, Caleb is deeply into uh, the uh, text mining and, and computer-assisted research. Uh, Ann Okerson, Ann Chicago Okerson will give us, uh, will comment and, and lead the uh, questions and answers and discussion after Paul and Robert Scott speak. So with that, I will um, hand you over to Robert Scott. Thank you, Bernie. 
My name was Hint Bob Scott, and, and I'm Digital Humanities Librarian at Columbia University. Um, I want to emphasize at the outset that the perspective I bring to our discussion today is that of a public service librarian learning his way through a rapidly unfolding and changing reality rather than that of a developer. I'm therefore very happy to be sharing the podium with Caliph, since I know he will be able to address some of the more technical questions many of you have, and with Anne, who brings so much wisdom and expertise to the field of vendor library relations. I look forward to learning much new, as I always do, from what they have to say. Next. In the era of big data and the cloud, the world of academic librarianship is facing dramatic changes. While the options that these changes represent have always been present, they are more apparent, they are apparent to a degree of unprecedented intensity today. Increasingly, libraries are becoming, or at least able to become, not just repositories of scholarly information, but workshops for the transformation of that content using tools that were largely unavailable to earlier generations. In that process, academic librarians can and increasingly need to begin to think of themselves not just as curators, but as collaborators and partners with their scholarly clientele in that transformation process. And the collections that the libraries contain can increasingly be looked upon not simply as discrete works, but as potential components of a larger, infinitely reshapable network of material, including even more information lying beyond their institutional walls. On all these fronts, traditional boundaries are breaking down, and a new synthesis is emerging. Data mining and natural language processing are two important and powerful tools coming to, fore in the, to the fore in this new world. I want to speak today about two text mining and natural language processing projects which I've had the opportunity to participate in at Columbia and what that experience suggests to me about the future direction of our profession. Next. At Columbia, I work in a department called the Digital Humanities Center, an outgrowth of an older unit known as the Electronic Tech Services Unit, established well over two decades ago to take advantage of the exciting new opportunities that text and electronic format was going to present to scholarly research. It has carried on zealously for all these years, but for much of that period, its efforts were frankly confined to its little corner of the institution. While the unit did a good job of making digitization and resource management part of an increasing number of Columbia Scholars' workflow, the number of projects it could support was limited, and they were forced to rely on the existing, albeit very rich, collections of the university's library. They tended to rely as well on out-of-the-box software and had relatively limited capacity for online delivery. For that matter, the number of scholars interested in such projects was relatively small and self-selecting. Nonetheless, some very good work was done, one of my favorites illustrated here being a study of ethnic politics in the early 20th century Ottoman Empire based on locally digitized material. Other digital work, some of it quite ambitious, was taking place in academic units elsewhere on campus in a siloed environment that was characteristic of Columbia and many other major universities there was not much opportunity for cross-fertilization or the kind of collaboration necessary for more ambitious, wide-ranging projects. Hence, the surging new opportunities of big data and the recent buzz around digital humanities have provided a welcome sea change. Suddenly, in the last two or three years, we are seeing an increasing number of students and faculty interested in more ambitious projects for analyzing the contents of large collections of text. And the Zeitgeist has also encouraged once separated units start working more closely together to find solutions to common research needs. The two projects I want to discuss briefly today are very much a product of this new environment. Next. First, the declassification engine is the result of an, an initiative by Professor Matthew Connolly of Columbia's History Department, who is interested in wrestling with the challenges posed to modern U.S. historians by the enormous and burgeoning amount of classified documentary material. Even when that material is made available through a Freedom of Information Act request, its heavily redacted character, as illustrated by the example here, could be a real challenge to decipher. Somehow, one needs to be able to read behind as well as between the lines to make sense of them, not only for the purposes of historical research, but also for the kind of informed discourse that is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. Connolly and his colleagues sought to assemble a vast collection of data to which the processes of machine learning and natural language processing can be brought to bear to study semantic patterns in the classified documents with the fourfold aim of analyzing patterns of official secrecy, analyzing the process of textual redaction, 
modeling spatial and temporal patterns of classified communications, and recreating the history of official secrecy. Next. That project, by surveying the broad body of documents, particularly once materials have become declassified, seeks to map patterns within the material overall, as we can see in this graph showing the number of memos containing the word Boulder, the name of a top secret intelligence initiative, that were withheld from the public in the early 1970s. Next. Likewise, by comparing redacted and unredacted versions of documents, when these have become available, the engine can begin to learn patterns and principles underlying the blacking out of text to such an extent that, while it was not the original aim of the project, the engine can actually begin to make intelligent guesses about what may lie behind the dark lines in documents as yet available only in redacted form. Next. One of the aims of the project was to bring together the full corpus of relevant documents scattered across a number of collections and databases, many of them with fairly simple or even crude retrieval tools. Connolly turned to the DHC for assistance in, in obtaining access to this kind of material for the content of two of our major licensed collections, Cengage's Declassified Documents Reference System and ProQuest's National Security Archive. Given our long history as customers and consultants with those two publishers, it was relatively easy to initiate the discussion, and it was gratifying to see that both were interested in exploring how they might give scholars deeper access to their holdings, albeit as a pilot. That said, this was fairly new territory for them, and it took many, many weeks of regular, persistent, gentle pressure to ensure that the plans made their way through the hoops before the material was ultimately delivered. We were also able to provide assistance with the more established but nonetheless cumbersome procedures for obtaining massive files of declassified State Department memos from the National Archive. And even that process has not been as straightforward as one might have expected. The project team, for example, has just discovered a large gap in what was supposed to have been included in the data that was delivered. And I'm in the process of finding out from NARA just what went wrong. We were able to provide assistance to the project in other ways as well. Last spring, the DHC provided a venue for an interdisciplinary digital humanities center taught by Connolly and Dennis Tennant of the English Department. My colleagues Alex Hill, of the library's, the library's digital scholarship coordinator, contributed substantively to the syllabus for that class. And the project work of one of the two teams of graduate and undergraduate students actually helped to jumpstart what would ultimately become the, declassify, the declassification engine. Next. An analogous undertaking in a very different field was Chartex, an international collaborative project involving <coughs> scholars from York, Brighton, Leiden, Toronto, Seattle, and New York, and funded by the Digging into Data program. It aims to explore how the formulaic language of the massive surviving corpus of medieval legal documents could be used to identify spatial and human relationships within the data. After an initial phase of training through manual markup, Natural language processing and data mining tools are used to provide that analysis, which can then be explored through a scholar's workbench. Columbia's representative, Adam Costo, one of the world's leading experts on medieval charters, who had worked with us in many areas before, contacted the DHC about participating in the project, and we have been able to take part in a variety of ways, including the processing of data, coding, advising, and helping to organize an evaluation of the finished project by a group of students and researchers. The following slides provide a brief overview of the project. Next. Here's an overview of the components in the workflow from charter document to Chartex work, workbench. Next. Here we have a comparison of the hand annotation of the corpora that were used initially to train the software, this left-hand panel being done using a software called BRAP, uh, the right hand, admittedly shooting fish in a barrel, showing the software's parsing of that same text to give you an idea of, of how it works as well. Next. Here's a little bit more schematic view of what was happening in the national natural language processing using a, a program, a Java program based program known as ELF uh, that was run out of the University of Brighton for us. Next, an example of the results of data mining of that analyzed material showing the relationships between the people, uh, their occupations, places, and, and family relations. And next. Uh, the broader networks of related individuals that can be derived as a result by people using the scholar's workbench. Next. 
Sadly, while we tried, we were not as successful as in the declassification project in negotiating with commercial publishers for access to content. Nature published collections of value here are produced largely by European publishers, and the continent's more guarded approach to intellectual property turned out to be a showstopper. This kind of approach is regrettable, not only for this project, but I would also regard for the continuing vitality of the impressive published collections that those publishers have produced. In fact, in general, this is something I think that, that all publishers of vended material need to think about in the day of open source and big data, how they're going to continue to remain relevant when people expect their data to be so easily accessible. Instead, Chartex to date has relied on material from the above, which were produced by a variety of academic institutions. Columbia has also undertaken to digitize a set of data on its own, a few thousand Latin charters from Poland in the 13th through 15th centuries, but that process has proven very time consuming, and the material will not be available for analysis until later this spring. Next. Our experience with these two projects has been valuable and encouraging. The DHC is pressing on with additional projects, including an ambitious open syllabus project led by Dennis Tennant of the English Department and Alex Hill, our digital scholarship coordinator, which aims to mine the content of over a million syllabi to study phenomena such as canon building. A slightly different project with a group of faculty and independent researchers aims to digitize the raw materials assembled several decades ago for the Language and Culture Atlas of Ashkenazic Jewry providing enhanced online map making and analysis capacity for this data. Needless to say, we find this a very attractive direction for libraries to pursue. But of course, such projects have not always taken place in libraries. And there are voices today that would suggest that the library may not necessarily be the best site for such work, and that their role may even represent a dose of inappropriate hubris in an aspiration to take on such a leading role. I would beg to differ. While the library is not necessarily going to be the leader of all such efforts, there are powerful arguments on behalf of its potential role as a venue for ventures of this kind. Indeed, I would argue that our leading academic libraries should be willing to embrace such a role if they hope to continue to play a leading role in the University of Tomorrow. Next. The library as the storehouse and cataloger of resources is a natural starting point for, for researchers wanting to undertake big data projects. Moreover, a new generation of librarians with more advanced academic credentials and subject fields is increasingly suited to work in full collaboration with faculty counterparts. Their disciplinarity of so much modern scholarship makes a venue outside of an individual department most appropriate, and historical experience with this aggravating and hindering vertical separation between universities, various academic units in the past, makes one dream of a visible, central, and accessible location. And it's hard to imagine a, 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 an institution that fulfills those requirements more fully than the library. Lastly, the library is uniquely suited to provide a broad and comprehensive access to the tools and resources created by big data projects, particularly when an institutional repository is placed within its purview. Next. Embracing this new world presents librarians with new and enhanced roles. As in the past, they are well poised here to serve as advisors, in this case to help researchers identify the licensed and freely available resources that may serve as suitable raw material, to refer scholars to other at their institution or beyond who are engaged in similar work, and to point to the tools and methods that are most suitable for the task. We, in fact, find ourselves called upon increasingly at the DHC to answer questions of this very kind, far more frequently than in the big data days. Next. A particularly important and interesting new role for librarians is as negotiators, persuading publishers of licensed data to make their content available in deeper ways, but at the lowest possible cost. Many publishers still seem to be hovering in pilot mode, trying to decide whether they must and or can charge for those additional services. Inable concerns about the protection of intellectual property and the products produced by large-scale data mining projects, which we need to address. In the declassified project, at least, I think, we found that mutually satisfactory arrangements about protecting intellectual property are quite achievable. It has been particularly interesting and revealing to talk vendors through their thinking about the various settings in which such data might be made available, whether simply through an API, which I sense many of our researchers find inadequate for what they want to accomplish, 
and which seems potentially to threaten a slowing down of database response, or whether through a vendor-produced sandbox, which allows more secure publisher control of the data, but also will engender higher costs on their side, or lastly, whether simply through the delivery of files to the researcher, which is what appears to appeal to most of our scholars here at Columbia. In fact, for institutions that have already published or purchased some of these licensed digital collections, the solution may be actually lying at their feet and require no real further negotiations. Those purchase contracts almost always specify the right of the buyer to request a copy of the data for internal use, a notion that may have once seemed almost laughable to many institutions, but in this era of big data mining, suddenly takes on new resonance. Res Next. Finally, there are the many roles that librarians can and need to adopt when they participate more fully in a project, and I can report that I have had a chance to at least dabble with all of them thus far. Pairer of material, consultant, grant writer, coder, evaluator, curator, disseminator, and instructor. Next. The opportunities of big data for academic libraries are enormous. However, if libraries are to take full advantage of these opportunities, they need to rise to the challenge. Staff, in many cases, will need to acquire new technology and project management skills. We are addressing this here at Columbia in the History and Humanities Division through a training program called the Developing Librarian, centered around a group project to create a small prototype documentary history of Morningside Heights, the neighborhood where the university is located partnerships outside the library and outside the institution need to be formed, even when these may challenge some old institutional conceptions about who is or is not an affiliate. Positions become vacant, new staff with appropriate skills may need to be hired, and the job descriptions of current staff may need to be revised. And most importantly, institutions need to be seriously willing to carve out the time for their staff to undertake what is a new, challenging, but ultimately very promising direction in their work and that promises to ensure the continuing vitality of the academic library in a radically changing environment. Next, and I, next, and just give you some links here to further material. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. The, um, we have uh, some comments from uh, people attending that say that they're having trouble with the audio and we uh, we think we've corrected that but let us know if you're still having trouble with it um, um, we um, are taking questions please is we said I said we uh, muted your phone line so you'll have to chat your questions in but we would welcome some of those now questions for Bob we have one question which is why um, Bob you, you mentioned that the APIs were inadequate for many scholars, the APIs um, to uh, in, in using in mining uh, large bodies of text. Can you say a little bit more about that? Oh, Bob, you have to unmute your phone. Yes, yes, and I, I, I just did. I've, I've discovered with a number of the APIs we're working with that there may often be at least initially limitations on how much can be pulled down at once and the willingness of, of, of of vendors to allow people to fully access the material through them. But more importantly, what I think is a, is a subject for potential concern is that when you're using the API, you're often, you know, database in ways that may be interfering with other activities. I think people feel more comfortable having the data at their own disposal, disposal and working with it. And I have to say that the scholars I've talked to almost in every case much prefer to have it in hand so that they can experiment and see what else can be done with it. Uh, this may represent a learning curve for them as well as for us, but it seems that having that data on site has enabled, for example, the, the declassified documents project to move forward much more effectively. So it's a lot easier to do with, with non-proprietary data, though, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah, that's, that's true, and I'm really talking about vendor collections here. Yeah. So. Um, we have another question. Do you have any suggestions for libraries looking to establish a digital humanities initiative? Big question. <coughs> besides, besides getting raise more money. Well, yes, yes. There, that's that's it. Perhaps perhaps talk to your dean and and persuade your dean that this is something you need to do. I think I think there are a number of pieces involved there. If you want to identify faculty members on campus 
who have a, a burning desire to undertake such a project. It was very helpful that, that prominent individuals like Matt Connolly or, or Adam Costo were available to suggest that this was what they wanted to undertake. The other side of that is getting your staff up to speed for this kind of thing. And for that, I would very much uh, recommend the, the kind of training initiative that we've undertaken here at Columbia, which is to kind of step librarians themselves through a digital project that can help them to really learn how things are put together and feel more confident in, in being able to solicit and, and then to support uh, activities of scholars. But uh, make no mistake, there, one, needs, one needs financial resources devoted to this to be able to do it and, and on your institution and what it's done so far. Great, thanks, Bob. Someone sent you a question directly, so if you'll uh, look at your chat screen, you, maybe you can get that one. I'm seeing it here. You get to see it. Oh, wait, yes, yes. Oh, wait, wait, here. Yes, yes. Right. Down here below the horizon. Um, okay, you're, you're referring to my hubris comment. <laughs> I think, I think that what I'm talking about here is the discussion that kind of surrounded the, the, recent, the recent OCLC uh, uh, study of whether your library needs a digital humanities center and the, the statement there that there needed to perhaps be some, some, some pride control uh, to make libraries realize that they're not all things to all people. And I, I think the, the pushback from a lot of people in the digital humanities field you look particularly at Bethany Novisky's comment uh, to that, suggests that that was at least read that way uh, by some people. I may have created a bit of a straw man here. Uh, but I think, I think it's clear from what we see happening on campus and what we have traditionally seen here that often those faculty units don't come to the library. They work on their own. And we've had to go out and try to find them. This, the, the current buzz of digital humanities and the, the support of upper level of academic administration has made that process a little less difficult. But we still need to do a lot of outreach. And, and we've benefited enormously, I have to say, from having Alex Hill, who some of you may know, here as our digital scholarship coordinator. He's really doing a great job of reaching out. But the fact that many of those places didn't feel that they needed to involve the library may suggest that they at least think our role is not essential. All right, thanks, Bob. That was. Um covered a lot of territory there. We're going to move on to our next uh, presenter, who is uh, Kalev Litaro from Georgetown. Kalev, you can unmute your phone. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, we can. Excellent. All right. Uh, first slide. Excellent. Well, it's a tremendous honor and uh, pleasure uh, to be presenting to all of you here today. I'm going to be covering uh, a lot of ground here, but hopefully trying to give you a, a, a nice sort of overview uh, uh, from, from a practitioner standpoint. Next slide. So what I'm going to start with is, um, is it uh, uh, slide number two? There we go. Uh, so, you know, what does it look like? So sort of turning back the covers and saying, what does it look like uh, to actually study the world through the lens of, of data mining? Next slide. So I'm showing you here just sort of a cross-section of, of just a couple of my, my recent projects. And the images go from top, from top right in, clock, in clockwise order. Uh, but the project was mapping the complete English text of Wikipedia, which uh, involved uh, uh, taking all 4 million English language entries, about 40 gigs worth of text, uh, and applying uh, what's called full-text geocoding algorithms to actually read through the text, identify located me uh, textual, location, textual mentions of location, disambiguating that and placing that in a map, uh, extracting about 40, 40 million dates out of that, and then actually building a network connecting all that together. Uh, the first large-scale examination of the geography of social media. So this was a, a, a massive project on how much geography can we recover from things like Twitter. Uh, another project is, spread, is tracing the spread of ideas through space over uh, millions of books. Uh, another project, obviously, is the collaboration uh, with Matt at, at Columbia that, that uh, Bob was just talking about. Uh, where, how do you visualize the millions of declassified state department cables? How do you go through and extract a geography from that and allow those to be mapped in an interesting way? Uh, for the, the Google Constitute project, how do we compile the world's constitutions in, in digital forms? And I was, I was actually uh, helping lead the, the early phases of that, um, run by Tom Ginsburg and, and uh, 
not El and uh, uh, Elkin. Uh, how do we map half a million hours of American television news? Uh, how do we study how social media is in conflict? Uh, create new ways of, of visualizing emotion for television? Uh, and how do we ultimately uh, create a network diagram of, of all global news media worldwide and extract out everything that's recorded about Earth from all that? Next slide. Uh, so kind of looking into the hood, uh, you know, just a couple of projects I've described to you use a whole range of data sets. Uh, so everything from Wikipedia, fully open, Twitter, which requires commercial licensing. There is a free one percent stream, but it's it not it has a lot of problems. Uh, things like Hypertrust uh, and NARA, which I, I put it through a semi-open, uh, in that uh, with Hypertrust you have to go through, you have to sign a lot of agreements. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on what you can do. In, in fact, originally uh, we were actually told you're not permitted to create engram uh, from it. You're not permitted to do certain types of analyses with it. Both of that now, uh, you know, with, with pushback, it's have gone away. NARA and, and sometimes some of those data sets, they require some cost recovery and there's some other oddities to that. Uh, things like Internet Archive, uh, you know, book digitization, uh, news media, JSTOR, uh, television, the BLR stands for the virtual reading room, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, computing platforms, everything from experimental supercomputers to the cloud, um, you know, range of algorithms, range of languages, and range of tools. So, in other words, there is no sort of one data set, one platform, one algorithm, language, or tool. Uh, this type of, of, of data mining really spans everything. And, and that, that by itself creates problems because how on earth can you sort of help when, you know, when, when something is this fragmented? Next slide. So one of the particular things I want to, to talk about was, so I, was an innovation we called the virtual reading room. Um, so most of the, but some of the, many of the most in-demand data sets that scholars are, are looking for are either licensed or commercial. Uh, so these things cannot be bulk downloaded. Uh, so for example, when I look at the archives, television news archives, uh, they can't simply box all that up and ship that to me on USB drives. That cannot leave their physical premises. Um, so what we came up with was this concept of the virtual reading room. You think about, in a traditional library, you go in, you find what you need, you check it out, and you read with it. Uh, in an archive, you go in, you request the material you want, and you can, uh, you can read that material in the archive, take notes, and then when you leave, you, all the material has to stay in the archive. Only your notes can go with you. And that's the, no, that's the notion of the virtual reading room, where it's actually what's known as a virtual machine, which actually runs physically on premises at the Internet Archive, uh, in this case, where basically uh, sc authorized scholars can submit codes, they can access all this material, do all the data mining there, and then only the final residual product can leave. And that gets around the limitations of engrams and other uh, tools that don't allow you to do really sophisticated analyses. Uh, what's particularly exciting about this is in our conversations with the major publishers, uh, most of the, of the major publishers that, that, that would come to mind, uh, most of them have expressed interest in this model. Uh, and you're likely to start seeing the first pilot offerings in the next 24 months. Uh, you know, most publishers now are still realizing we need to offer data mining access. Uh, we're losing this battle. How do we do this? Now, it's going to be fee-based. Uh, every one of those publishers is going to charge for it, but it's going to be a fairly incremental fee over existing license fees. Uh, and the best part here is that libraries will be the gatekeepers here. They will handle account management and all that. So it really puts libraries centrally uh, in a central role. Next slide. Uh, now, beyond, uh, beyond license collections, it's also a very powerful solution for bulk access data mining. Essentially, you set up a cluster or, or uh, you set up a, a set of machines, and you have a central set of, da of data sets, uh, either open data sets, licensed data sets, tools, and others. And researchers can basically use this central cluster for everything, whether it's licensed or open. So, in other, so the Internet Archive Virtual Reading Room, we use that for both the television news pro uh, project, but also a new project that we're going to be announcing here shortly. Uh, we process the entirety of the Internet Archive visual book collection, extracted out every image from every page of every book they've ever digitized, uh, dating back to the year 1500, almost 60 million images. Uh, and you can see a little montage there in the lower right. Now, all of those books are fairly open. Those, these are specifically the public domain books that anyone can access today from their website. But having the, the virtual reading room, the infrastructure there, made it very trivial to do this analysis. Next slide. Uh, and so, again, this notion of, of can you sort of centralize sort of into a cloud environment? And it makes it very easy to manage licenses, manage software, uh, you know, cloud burst out to commercial clouds or, or NSF supercomputing resources as need, uh, wrap APIs. And I did want to note one thing. Uh, not all data sets that libraries purchase actually permit data mining. Uh, and that's something you need to be very careful about. A lot of libraries have purchased their CD collections. They well, you know, we own this now. We can allow data mining. A lot of them actually have specific prohibitions on, uh, on specific types of, of usage. So that's something you always want to check on. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, when you think about what's the process, the workflow of a large big data project, uh, well, there's sort of the translation of the researcher's question. So the researcher says, I want to study, uh, you know, the, you know how, how governments classify material. Well, how do you translate that to a computational question? Uh, and that's something that libraries can really help with, help fit them down with. Obviously, security data access, getting algorithms, security computer uh, resources, and then finally, what happens when the project ends? And then uh, my book is actually something that, that has, has taught me a lot about how do we actually do this process? How do we really sit down, and, and this is essentially a menu that I came up with when I sit down with faculty and say, here, read this book, and then come back to me, and, you know, and it sort of explains. Because many faculty, they don't know about things like geographic coding, sentiment mining, topic modeling, all these things. So helping them know what's possible can, can be truly transformative. Next slide. Uh, and, and you think about libraries really need to move from just being a repository of knowledge towards helping. You know, don't just hand a picture in a book. Help collaborate with them. So really moving from a provider to a partner. Uh, and, and both Columbia and Stanford Institute of Humanity Centers, I, I think a perfect example of this comes in their library. The collaborative mindset where a staff member comes, you sit them down, you talk with them, and you sort of help them go through this entire process. Uh, and, and things like workshops and socializing this, alerting them to new data sets and grant programs. Next slide. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, one of the things I, I want to note was it really needs to be a service deal. It needs to be something that scholars can just come and, and they're supported. And it can't be cost recovery because most scholars just don't have the budget to, to, to handle this uh, on their own. Uh, and, uh, and, and I want to add a real word of warning. There's, there's, you know, a lot of people say, well, just point them to some, find some CS professor. If someone, if a historian comes along and says, I want to do topic modeling, uh, just find some CS professor who doesn't connect the two. That doesn't work because CS faculty and students even if there's money on the table, uh, they have to get publications. And they can't get a publication on something that isn't technically interested. Uh, so 99.9% .9 of the research, in my experience, doesn't cross that threshold, so they're not interested in doing anything with it. Uh, and these are things where my base can really help and handle the vast majority of those, and then liaison with, with, with CX professors and others for those, those upper bound ones. Uh, and in particular, I should add that a lot of CS departments now are requiring, uh, the, in their undergraduate programs, are requiring under, uh, seniors to actually take design courses where they actually uh, essentially have to do a semester project for someone at no cost. So that can be a way of sort of piloting this out. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, so gateways and gatekeepers. So again, most of the data sets aren't available for data mining. However, most publishers, in my experience, are willing to have a conversation. But unfortunately, there's been enormous damage done to this uh, because historically, so many faculty have come along to, and to publishers uh, and said, hey, you know, I've got this great idea, I want to do this project. The publishers historically were very open to talking with them. But what happened is, is and I found this publisher after publisher, rather than feedback, you know, we, in the past we would have jumped at this and immediately provided data to you, but we've had so many projects that we did all this investment, and then the fact that we got the data, we realized they couldn't do anything with it, and so it was a waste of our time. Uh, and so that's something where I think libraries can really help, because they can act as gatekeepers. Sit down with faculty member and work through it. Ensure that they have the computational resources, the work plan. They know, they don't just have an idea, they know how to execute it. Uh, and then sort of help, help ensure that, that they don't reach out to the publisher until they're ready for success. So essentially then the library helps the gatekeeper. So when the library reaches out to someone like ProQuest, they can say, we vouch for this person. They're ready to go. Uh, and in most APIs, they should add another challenge with APIs. Most APIs are not designed, you're not for single exports. Like, for example, Library of Congress's Congress of America, you can download a set of pages or hyper trust. Uh, but most data mining requires vast amounts of material that you can't do from those APIs. There are bulk uh, download APIs. So Propa or um, uh, LexisNexis, Fetchief, and others allow bulk exporting material, uh, but these are very expensive. So libraries can help bulk negotiate that. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, so another way that uh, libraries can really help is with information sharing. Uh, so you think about, for example, the Internet Archive is they're looking for scholars interested in making use of its collections. For example, it has half a petabyte of everything crawled from .gov over the last 15 years. Uh, this actually, uh, when, I, I, uh, when I was working at Matt on, the, on his project, I actually uh, asked him, I said, hey, you know, uh, Internet Archive is a huge collection. Are there others that you know of at Columbia that I might reach out to that might have an interest? And he actually responded, well, actually, uh, I've been trying to find a way of getting all the, all the material from four reading rooms on U.S. government websites. Could we do this? Uh, and so oftentimes you can't anticipate how people, who might be interested in these things. So having sort of a local campus mailing list, for example, where you can sort of forward things out. Or when we release an image archive from, from the Internet Archive, uh, 
how is it they were not to the right people? Or like Toto and Janet now have their data gift program. Uh, you know, very few faculty in the humanities and social sciences are aware of that program right now. It's mostly CS faculty that have become heavily aware of it. And so how do you sort of help, you know, how do you sort of help do that? Uh, and, and some of that might be something like a, uh, say, a CRL or something, creating sort of a, a national mailing list uh, where you can sort of exchange the you know, latest grant programs and information and, and so on. Next slide. And then finally, of course, the life cycle. Uh, so the output of these projects tend to be very, very large. Uh, in some cases, it can be terabytes of data. Uh, so helping faculty understand which of their output, uh, output products are shareable. Oftentimes, vendors will say, here, you know, I'll give you a dump of everything I hold, of the entirety of, of the following 20 newspapers, uh, but no text, only codified numeric representations can be released. So, uh, and engrams may or may not qualify for that. So kind of helping bridge, you know, going back to the publisher and finding out when you allow us to release this, 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 and then once you determine what can be released, uh, having the services to do that. That's the fact we can't just put that up on a website somewhere. You're going to really have to help with the bandwidth and disk. Uh, and increasingly the use of interactive. Uh, so a lot of faculty, for example, are using interactive web uh, mapping tools. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commercial services out there, and we use a free account set it up, and then a few months later that service is gone and everything has died. Uh, but more and more, those services rely on open source software, uh, so uh, libraries can help with that, blog hosting, uh, uh, mapping hosting, and so on. Libraries can help host all that for them. Next slide. So thank you very much. Carlo, thank you. That was very good. The, um, thanks for speaking so quickly. I know we, we I have to tell people who are attending that we put an enormous amount of pressure on our presenters today to um, squeeze a lot of content into a very small uh, time frame. We do have a couple questions. Uh, one, <coughs> someone in, in this for Carlo, this is this is for you. Um, you mentioned the virtual reading room and that there is some um, interest among the publishers. In, among some publishers in, in that concept and, 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 and things are underway. And he, are you able to say which publishers, some, some people say, was it LexisNexis or is it Westlaw or Thomson Reuters or Elsevier? I can't say which, I can't say which publishers yet, but I can say that there, there hopefully will be some big announcements here soon. Uh, and, uh, and I should add that that's, so the virtual reading room is a concept. So it's basically this, this whole combination of, and there's a, a, a post we did for the Knight Foundation that is in more detail, but it's a legal, technical, and methodological infrastructure. Uh, and, and from a methodological standpoint, it even goes down to how do you split the analysis that you do? What are the enabling parts that have to touch the actual full license content? And then what are the rest of the analyses that can be broken to the residual products? So you can kind of split what compute happens where and what touches what data. Uh, and so that framework, we both have deployed at the Internet Archive and are using actively now for their TV archive and other material. But then that same framework then, uh, publishers are looking at implementing. They will do it on a cost recovery basis. Uh, actually, more likely, uh, probably, a, 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 well, not cost recovery, an actual profit margin. Uh, but likely not that bad. And, and the nice thing about that is it will offer, it will offer basically real researchers, especially the models being discussed is, you know, if you're paying X amount for some uh, product, you'll pay a little bit more for data mining access. You'll get maybe 10, 20 accounts or however many licenses you need. And then you'll get a set of logins to virtual machines. And then you will manage that in your campus. Some faculty member comes along and says, I want to data mine and all this stuff. You hand them a login. You hand them, um, you know, that stuff. And then basically uh, they go do their, their mining uh, stuff. Uh, and then when they're done, they check it back to you. You check it out to the next person. And the library is sort of the gatekeeper that helps manage that whole process. And basically when the researcher logs in, they see every product from that vendor that, that, that their institution subscribes to. And it's all in machine friendly format. So it's designed specifically for data mining. Uh, and, you know, from the publisher's standpoint, they're seeing the both as, A, they can stop all these people who are trying to reverse engineer their APIs and hack into them and doing all this illegal stuff. Uh, and, uh, B, they can basically, you know, get, uh, and, and essentially they can generate a revenue source from it. Uh, and then also, again, it, from, a, from a researcher standpoint, they have an equal way to do their data mining, and they have a platform that's specifically designed for data mining. So it sort of, it, 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 it solves all those issues. Uh, and, and I think, you know, what, the feedback that I've been getting from, from most of the large publishers is that we've been looking for a model like this, uh, and sort of, the, the problem is sort of, you know, how do you actually do it? There's so many moving parts. It's a simple concept, but actually developing it to detail is very complex. So that's what we've been doing is building this reference model 
uh, that can be deployed. And the nice thing is there's a lot of discussion about having it fairly universal. So you can essentially take your 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 work on one on what using one vendor's products and instantly move it to so if you're using newspapers in one case and you're moving to this in another place, you can constantly move among them. Good. You, a lot of what you're talking about is is proprietary content or dealing with the, the paywalls. Um, I wonder, is with the government content though, it sounds like that's a lot of what was used at Columbia and a lot of what um, what you've been using as well, which is open, open access. Is it possible that uh, text mining tools are going to enable us to leapfrog the, leapfrog the aggregators to get the aggregators out of the supply chain? Will the uh, text mining tools be robust enough to enable us to interact, in, enable scholars and libraries to interact directly with the, the content, these big databases? Not really, because uh, if you look at the commercial companies, I mean, you know, Google News is absolutely spectacular, for example, uh, but, you know, the vast majority of what's in Lexis and FactTube and others is simply not published on the web. Uh, and publishers, so publishers are, are, you know, there's a lot of material you can get on the web, uh, but there's a lot you can't. Uh, and a lot of the material is commercially licensed, and that's because that, that is a major revenue source. Uh, so I think you, you certainly you certainly will not. But what's interesting is Wall Street actually is driving a lot of this uh, because Wall Street really has you know it's because of Wall Street that the major vendors like Lexis, Factiva, uh, ProQuest, and others all have commercial APIs that you it costs a fortune. Uh, but basically, it's an API you can bulk download the entirety of their holdings, uh, but you can rack up a budget in, in the millions or tens of millions of dollars very rapidly. Uh, but they have those infrastructures in place, and the budgets are there. Uh, the goal is how do we create a new infrastructure that supports more academic research. Uh, in terms of, of open content, though, that's another benefit of the, of the reading room model is you can think of this sort of a cloud. You're setting up a, a cloud infrastructure that has tools and processes and all this, and the commercial vendors, uh, so a commercial company, they would host it, you know, they would host their own private cloud, but the, the sort of the concepts and the processes would be very similar, so it would allow you to sort of move things in and out. So if you have, say, a local, your local cloud, you might run on your campus a local cloud that hosts this Wikipedia and uh, NARS content and all the, the government and other materials that are open access uh, and host all those locally and then things on commercial tools that you may have licenses for like ARC, if you have a, a university-wide site license, uh, you might get permission to be able to deploy the, the uh, server uh, and alert tools within this cloud. Uh, again, that really depends on your license with ARC. But that type of thing, we centralize everything. So the researchers come along and say, hey, you know, I want to do topic modeling in this. And you can say, hey, we've already got it all set up, all the software is installed. Here's a how-to guide. You don't need to do anything. Here, just log in here, everything's here, click this button, and start using it. And so that ability to really sort of centralize uh, that and, and basically help sort of support one sort of infrastructure, uh, and then if some CS person comes along and says, hey, you know, I built some new tool for silent mining, they can go ahead and you can say, hey, great, install it here, and then they set it up, and now suddenly it's available to all of your campus researchers. Uh, so that notion of, of being able to, and, and the nice thing is that those cloud models, that they, if they're done properly and they match, then all of a sudden someone can take that same code then and copy that over to a commercial vendor uh, that's offering a VR model and run that same code, but this time run it on a license collection. So kind of that, that that movement of right now where things are very chaotic and ad hoc to really sort of say let's set up centralized environments where all the tools are there, we have all the expertise on it, uh, and it makes it really, really simple and it allows you then as a library uh, to sort of, you know, create a central place that everyone gathers around, but also be able to, to, to force connections with say the NSF supercomputing grid, commercial service providers, so if someone comes along and says, hey, you know what, I need 10,000 processors, you know, my project's so huge, I'm going to need 10,000 processors for a couple days to do this, you could set it up where maybe the library even has an Exceed account uh, and can basically burst them onto an Exceed, super, or Exceed is the NSF supercomputing program, burst them onto an NSF machine at no cost for a, for a day uh, and then off and, and sort of help sort of mediate that whole process. Great. Thanks, Carlos. We're, going to, we're um, dealing with a lot of very compressed information, so I want to remind people that we are archiving the PowerPoints and the audio of this webinar on the CRL website, so if you're registered for this webinar, you'll get a message from CRL pointing you to that. Uh, I want to introduce our next uh, presenter, actually Ann Okerson, we've asked to, um, to comment and to moderate some additional questions and answers. Ann Okerson is uh, CRL Senior Advisor on Electronic Resources Strategy. Ann? We 
your uh, not to get your voice in. I wonder if you unmuted your your phone. And could you press star six again, maybe? Waiting for Ann, I think it sounds like we're um, having technical difficulties. Um, we we do have a couple of questions. I can feed them into the middle, into the um, our speakers now. One of the questions was for Bob. Um, came in earlier. Uh, what about the time investment for what, what kind of time investment is Columbia putting into retraining of librarians? Um, you can do star six to unmute your line. It's it. It, it's been an interesting process. The, um, we found, as I said, by concentrating on, uh, we're, we're having bi-weekly meetings and, and, uh, for the Developing Librarian Project, and it's been very helpful in some ways to have a sort of unified project, and one that, that I think we can all relate to and that is modular enough that people can kind of uh, devote some time when it becomes available to them. That said, everybody complains about not having enough time to keep up. But we're at least able to, thanks to mostly Alex Hill's superb teaching, uh, having a regular instruction program going on every two weeks. We're all committed to attending that meeting. And there, there continues to be a lot of enthusiasm for it. I think one thing that's really key is this is an area of the, the local history of Columbia's neighborhood that everybody can relate to and everybody has their own sort of interest in. And so, so people are pursuing things. I, some of my colleagues who are, you know, running a conference somewhere else this year, the like, bemoan the fact that they, they can't devote as much time as they'd like. But we're, we're keeping up as a group. I mean, I think in all honesty, we haven't uh, perhaps come as far as we'd like, but I think what's important is just maintaining the pace and maintaining the vision. And we've just, we've just now broken up into project teams, and I think that's going to enable us to this a little bit more, but it's, it is a matter of sort of carving out some time. As I said, what, what helps is that, that this is a topic that, that everybody was able to relate to and has a, has a, a certain intellectual buy-in to simply out of, out of their own curiosity. But, but it is a challenge. I mean, even more challenging in terms of time. I mentioned about how, how our, I think, somewhat rashly committing to produce a set of, of digitized documents for the uh, for the Chartex project has been a lot more time consuming than we imagined. And so thinking about timing and realistically what one can manage on with a limited staff is is something one has to be constantly checking for. Thanks, Bob. Someone else? Uh, hi, Bernie. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. All right. I'm so sorry. I don't know what was happening here. But um, I was going to initially summarize what we've heard. But I think it speaks for itself. So let me do something a little bit different for the rest of my time. Um, some of the advanced questions have asked that we address, at least briefly, some copyright and license issues, particularly with regard to the recent Google ruling. So here we come back to licensing. And I think even the virtual reading room will require some licensing. Um, so first of all, what does U.S. case law say? Um, attorney Mike Carroll, who's now at American University, wrote recently in our mailing list, Slide License L, the Google Books decision provides us support because Google, Google created a digital archive of publishers' works for the purpose of making them searchable and to enable text mining. The court held that Google's creation of this archive and its continued retention was necessary to the beneficial purposes of providing search and text mining. Google's keeping the archive after it created its index did not affect the publisher's economic interests in exploiting the copyright works and therefore is a fair use. And Mike goes on to say, although the purpose of the text mining researcher and Google are rather different, they can both articulate a socially beneficial reason for keeping the private archive copy, and they're doing so doesn't interfere with the publisher's ability to exploit the works. Well, that's one view, uh, a very fair use friendly view. And then Sandy Thatcher, who's a publisher, replied, 
just to remind everyone, the Google, Google case is on appeal in the Second Circuit and is binding precedent now in only that circuit. One may reasonably argue, and I suppose the appeal will, that means giving participating libraries a copy of the Google scan of all of its books, displaced a sale of a digital copy, and that Judge Chin chose to ignore this market effect doesn't mean he was right. So, if the question is, does the Google really help us, uh, the answer is a definite maybe. So what about legislation? Uh, in U.S. law, text and data mining is not a copyright limitation or exception. Now, in December 2013, before the International Federation of Library Associations issued a set of TDM principles, and they introduced them thus. Because the technological processes of text and data mining involve copying the works in order to extract information from them, text and data mining are coming into conflict with copyright laws in many parts of the world. It believes that legal certainty for TDM can only be achieved by statutory exceptions. Um, now, how close are we to such legislation in the U.S.? Uh, my answer is um, not very. I know it's uh, is working very hard for us to negotiate a WIPO treaty for libraries. Uh, we, we will see what that does for us. Now, another thing I wanted to say was that CRL is currently coordinating a working group that's revising and updating the decades-long and well-used Clear DLS Library model license. And we've spent a lot of time talking about TDM. Um, I don't have a, a sort of draft for you right now, but the points we want to include for libraries to use in their negotiations are that authorized users can use the license material for TDM, uh, that they will have the ability, if they need to, to create a local archive. Uh, we will address unfettered downstream uses. And the concept of not paying again for data reuse for data which we've already paid for, that's not the same as a service, but it is for the data. So meanwhile, uh, publishers, as Caleb said, are starting to declare TDM support. It's very welcome, but it often has strings attached. Uh, for example, in return for access to a new TDM service that's available to authorized users via their new API, Elsevier imposes additional language and restrictions that are related to distribution, citation, and notice. Um, our working group thinks this is probably not good precedent, and whether libraries and consortia accede to those restrictions is right now hotly debated. So um, that's where we are with that question, and I'm sorry the answer is not very definitive and it, it took so long. Um, I do want to get back to the purpose of this uh, session which is how can librarians provide support uh, to our users? And so my question to both uh, Kaleb and Bob goes something like this. Uh, what could a librarian, Kaleb, have done for you when you were starting? And uh, I'm not at Columbia or Stanford. Um, I can't raise a lot of money for this. Is there any way my library can add value to students and researchers' TDM efforts? Is there a place to start? So th those would be my questions for our two presenters. We Bob, do you want to go first? I, yeah, whichever one of you wants to do it. No, I, I think that that at Columbia, and I don't know if this is the is the um, is 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 the final answer. Um, I think we found that we can work sometimes with vendors, and I think I think that that it's been helpful to have had those many years of of working together with them. And and for example, I have a student who's interested in doing a data mining project for a very small thing. He doesn't have any research budget for himself, and. We've been able to do some negotiating with ProQuest to get him access to some historical files that we think in ProQuest historical newspapers simply by the, the personal reaching out. Now, I don't know that that's a, that that's a good long-term or, or broad solution. I think it's probably helped that Columbia has already put a lot of money down on the table in the past, and there's a, there's a sense that this is, is, is a useful way to go. But I, I find, I think that, that we need to recognize the vendors are, you know, some of them play very hard, but I think others need to be very careful about playing too hard. 
Uh, when one hears Caliph, Caliph describe the wide range of resources that are available today out there, um, you sort of recognize that, that, that some of these folks better, better be thinking about how they make their services more readily available. And, and I found, at least in the discussions we've done around this one particular student project, that, that, um, that ProQuest seems interested to at least explore how we can, we can make this more available. It doesn't promise to have any great prestige value for them, but I think that they're themselves exploring how they can make these things reasonably accessible. So some of it is, I think, our ability to go to the vendors and to talk to them and to try to persuade them that perhaps we need to come up with better models. Yeah, so, I mean, from, from my perspective, I mean, first off, one of the nice things about the virtual reading and concept, the reason it is getting such traction, uh, is that it avoids all of those issues. Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, one of the issues with, with obviously all these readings that have been going back and forth is, well, do libraries and, and academic institutions have the right to stockpile material that is not theirs? Uh, and, you know, of course, you, you step both from the copyright law, but actually copyright law actually doesn't play that well. It plays a role, uh, but for libraries, actually, more often, it's, it's licensing law. Uh, in that, you know, a, a, uh, you know, one of the commercial vendors, they may have scanned, uh, you know, material, they may have scanned books from the early 1800s, uh, but, you know, copyright law would say the original book is out of copyright license law uh, has gone both ways. You know, there, there's been lots of lawsuits back and forth as to, well, you know, who actually owns, uh, you know, and, and, and the nice thing is copyright law has gone back and forth, but license law is where, actually, I should, I should clarify that. Copyright law has gone back and forth as to who owns that scam. License law is very clear. If you obtain that through a license from a commercial company like ProQuest, uh, you do not have the right to stockpile that and then distribute that, even though the original material might be uh, uh, might be uh, public domain, even though copyright law might prescribe certain things. License law is very different. And so that's one of the nice problems about the virtual reading room is that no longer is the library or the, or the institution's problem. If, if a commercial company, if one of the big vendors says, hey, you know, pay an extra 10000 a year, an extra 5000 a year, and you have full data mining access, uh, it's no different than the current subscription that you pay for a web, you know, for web access for people to search that service. Uh, all those issues go away. And that's, I think, one of the most compelling elements of the virtual reading room is that it sidesteps all of those issues uh, because it's the actual publishers and, and holders themselves that are providing that service. Uh, then in terms of, what, which I think is, is really where things need to go, because I think, you know, no matter how things settle out with things like Google Books and others, there are always going to be specialized collections uh, that simply are not available uh, 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 to, any, to any other means. In terms of how libraries can step into this, obviously there is a cost element to this, uh, but I think libraries can, can first step into it. A, you know, a centralized mailing list. You think about it, if there's some kind of centralized mailing list out there that, that all the libraries uh, subscribe to, that, you know, something like the Twitter data gift program comes out. But that would come out and say, hey, you know, forward this to all your faculty that are interested. Well, libraries, first off, that, that requires just a little bit extra staff time, but no different than the library tracking what the latest uh, commercial offerings are. Uh, so helping sort of spread information is a, is a first really huge step. Uh, but then I think, you know, starting the liaison in this, uh, you know, computer science programs, if you have a CS department in your, in your school that has a senior, a senior projects class where seniors have to do parameter projects for, for people, uh, that's a great way. Find a couple of uh, scholars, hash scholars that have really interesting projects. Partly with that, it starts out as, a, as essentially a zero cost uh, first step. Uh, and then start looking. And the nice thing is actually eventually this can be cost, this actually covers its cost. It's totally cost recovery uh, if you have the right source. So if you can get the right scholars in the poor, um, fund, what we have found is funding agencies don't want to fund collecting stuff. They don't want to pay and say, hey, you know, we'll give you $10 million to go digitize a bunch of stuff and put it up on the website. What they will fund, however, is research. So if someone, it's not, it's not enough to say, hey, I'd love to scan all these, you know, uh, uh, you know, medieval manuscripts on something. It can be very difficult to get funding for that. On the other hand, a scholar can go, uh, there are many organizations, a scholar can go say and say, you know, I'm looking at studying the following phenomena uh, in, you know, in medieval, uh, you know, medieval such and such area. To do that, I'm going to need all these materials. They're not digitized yet. So as part of my broader project, I'm going to digitize that and make that available. But that's, that's basically just an enabler to the broader research and the focus on the research. And it turns out that funders love, the, they don't like to fund collection or stores, they love to fund research. And so that becomes a backdoor of funding, and that's actually what we're finding uh, in a lot of the organizations I've worked with, uh, you know, they've been really strange. How do I get funding in this, in this changing environment? Uh, but the moment that you change it in, you shift that equation. You don't ask for money for, for, for digitizing or, or, or collection, you ask for money for research, um, it completely changes and, and funding becomes readily available. 
available. And I think the degree to which you can start partnering with people, that, that really starts changing that. And so a lot of it's just semantics. Great. That's going to have to be our last word. I want to thank uh, Bob and Kalov and Anne for a very informative webinar. I hope the session was useful to you. We have a lot of questions that went unanswered, but we will um, do what we can on the follow-up. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. Hi, this is Gwen Einat, everybody. I'm the name at the bottom of all your emails from us. Uh, just wanted to thank our presenters again. They devoted a lot of time to this presentation. Uh, if you do want to follow up with any of them, the contact information is on your screen right now. I'll also be sending out yet another email this afternoon with this information. Uh, next slide, please. We also have some upcoming webinars. If you enjoyed this one, we also have one about uh, access to the Linda Hall Library Collections for our members uh, with Ke our own Kevin Wilkes on March 5th and the Print Archives Preservation Registry on April 12th. Uh, Bernie, do you want to say a couple of words about the annual meeting? You know, the annual um, meeting of the Sierra Council of Voting Members is being held in conjunction with the Global Resources Collections Forum on April 24th and 25th. The Global Resources Collection Forum, it, we titled this year uh, Leviathan, Libraries and Government Information in the Age of Big Data. We're going to be looking at the problems and challenges of scholarly access to, and preservation of born digital government data and government records. And so, in fact, Matthew Connolly uh, from Columbia University, this project Bob talked about, uh, will be speaking about his work with de the declassification engine and the, uh, the um, challenges of dealing with State Department and CIA and FBI electronic records specifically. So we hope you'll uh, join us for that. That'll be an in-person event in <coughs> Chicago on April 24th and 25th. The uh, snow should be gone by then. Yeah, we promise the weather will be better by then. Then uh, the final slide, please. Uh, when you leave this event, there's going to be a pop-up survey. Please fill it out. It's really valuable for us to get your feedback on these events as we continue to refine our webinar program. Uh, also, if you want to view this presentation again or share with colleagues, we did record it and it will be up on our YouTube channel. There's actually a lot of archived presentations on our YouTube channel, so be sure to check that out. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our CRL Connect is uh, an online newsletter that you'll get about every two or three weeks to help keep you informed about future events like this one. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.